from the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, bringing you data-driven insights from the Cube and ETR. This is Breaking Analysis with Dave Vellante. Customers and partners are scrambling to respond to the shocks from Broadcom's swift changes to its VMware packaging, pricing, and partnership programs. Our data suggests customers have moved beyond the emotional shock phase into implementing their options. Our advice to large VMware customers has been to evaluate your ELA expiration timeframe and then work backwards from that with a project plan, isolate core workloads that can take advantage of the full VCS stack, pay the Broadcom tax on that, and avoid complex and risky migrations for that part of your estate. Now, smaller customers and those no longer paying VMware should either move off of VMware to a handful of options or seek MSP support immediately. We believe MSPs and other partners, whether they made the cut or not, should be diversifying revenue streams as either a hedge on future changes that Broadcom might deliver or, in some cases, as a survival tactic. Hello and welcome to this week's The Cube Research Insights, powered by ETR. In this breaking analysis, Rob Stretche and I review the VMware situation more than eight months after the Broadcom deal with VMware closed. We'll share eye-opening ETR data, which shows how quickly customers are moving portions of their estates off of VMware, and we'll review the options customers have and suggest a framework for customers, MSPs, and partners moving forward. Hey, Rob, how you doing? Doing great. Uh, this is a topic that's near and dear to my heart, talking to a lot of organizations as we ramp in to explore in the next couple of weeks here. All right, this will be a great preview. So let's go back to May of 2022, when Broadcom announced that it was acquiring VMware for $61 billion. And we wrote a post saying Broadcom will tame the VMware beast. Now, at that time, we said, we, we thought we, we thought that, that Broadcom was going to do a number of things. They're going to cut spending. They've done that. Uh, they've cut about $400 million uh, uh, since pre-acquisition. That's based on last quarter's commentary. And there's more to come. I think they've cut 2,800 employees. And the potentially, we have hearing numbers could be 10,000 or more. Uh, they said that they were going to delever. They've done that, uh, at least to a certain extent. They sold the EUC business. They tried to sell Carbon Black, uh, but pulled that back. Uh, they said they're going to narrow the focus, spend on R&D, going to grow revenue. I guess they grew revenue sequentially last quarter from 2.1 to 2.7 billion. And then they said they're going to target a $4 billion revenue run rate uh, for subs their subscription business. So remember, VMware was a little late to the game in terms of migrating folks to, to a subscription business. When that happens, companies that hurt the income statements. Um, and so VMware was maybe somewhat reluctant to do so and was living off of ELA renewals. Um, but they've also, Broadcom said they're going to simplify. Well, they've reduced the number of SKUs. They said from 8,000 uh, down to three or four. You know, let's say that was from thousands or even hundreds, but a lot to very few. And again, they promised that R&D will, will continue. Uh, we thought at the time that they were going to get rid of, at least I thought that they were going to dump Tanzu. Looks like that's not the case. They're going to give that a shot. Um, and it, the whole message is focus, 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 and get back to Broadcom operating margins of 60 to 61 percent versus VMware's Rob, which were 25 percent. And Rob, I would say that you know Broadcom's doing basically what it said it's going to do. Yeah, I don't, I don't think anybody is shocked or surprised. I think the swiftness at which it happened was a little bit shocking and surprising, not only to the end user community that was you know, very much in the VMware camp. I mean, again, you know, Explore has been basically one of the biggest, uh, I guess you could say, communities for quite some time. Uh, and I, I think it's taking a shot at this point where uh, people are looking for other communities and have broadened. But I also agree with you. And I, I think, again, there's some interesting numbers in the ETR data uh, around things like Tanzu and others, where I, I think they, they, you know, again, they're trying to do what, uh, you know, Broadcom had wanted them to do is move into the more modern application stack and really try to help modernize what VMware was doing, moving, you know, everything in. And back, like you said, back in March, they had some major announcements with their 
uh, private AI with their uh, new additions to vSphere, uh, the VCF platform, with some things like bringing Kubernetes in as a first party citizen. Yeah, thanks for that. And then let's, um, I've got a very simplified timeline here, Alex, you bring that up um, on the, the whole Broadcom VMware acquisition and close and what they've done since. So we say we go back to May of 22. In between May of 22 and November of 23, when the acquisition actually closed, there was a lot of speculation as what what's going to happen. As you said, they basically hawked in as doing exactly what he said, or maybe you know substantially what he said he was going to do. And then in that period, as you say, Rob, very swiftly, right after the close, the layoff started, the delevering started. Um, they basically consolidated many, many SKUs, thousands or hundreds or you know eight thousand, whatever you want to believe, really down to to four uh, VMware Cloud Foundation. Uh, 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 which is VCF, which is vSphere and vSAN, NX, NSX, uh, and then essentially uh, vSphere Foundation, VMware vSphere Foundation, uh, VVF, I think they call it, which is essentially ESX and ESXi, I guess. Uh, and then I, I thought at one point, Rob, they had Aria and, and Tanzu. I think they've taken Aria and bundled that into, into Tanzu. So they're fine tuning that model a little bit. They're responding to some of the part partner feedback, which has not placated the partners. The partners are are not happy, as we know, uh, because they're they were comfortable with their model. They they knew what that model was. That was very predictable for them. Um, but Broadcom has totally changed the game by focusing on VCF. That's where they're putting all the investments. Uh, are competing essentially with the public cloud uh, by providing an on-prem alternative. And really focus at the top of the pyramid for for customers. That's what the implication is there. The top, you know, couple thousand customers. And customers are right now in the process of evaluating options and alternatives. And a lot of them are making moves. And we're going to talk about that in some detail. Uh, but but as you say, it took a long time for the deal to close. But once it closed, boy, Rob, Broadcom moved fast. Yeah, they did. And I think, like you said, they basically have three titles now with this, the, the essentials, the standard and the cloud foundation. And they're, they've kind of kept separate, which to your point on deleverage kind of uh, makes you think what's going to happen in the package when they go out and promote uh, VCF. Uh, they have Aria and Tanzu as kind of separate pieces to it. Uh, but basically if, if you want the everything pieces, if you want the high end VSAN, if you want the the Kubernetes, you want the log management, all of that, you're going to, you know, VCF, you're going to the cloud foundation, all you can eat in a bundle uh, piece. Because even with standard, you're kind of getting some things that you could keep you running, uh, like includes v vSphere, vCenter standard, like get that out of my mouth. But, you know, when you start to look at what it doesn't include, it's like, hundreds of things it doesn't include. And I, I think for me, when I started going through that, great, even in this, even in the essentials, the low end package, it doesn't include the lifecycle management for upgrade. So you start to look at things that are in there, uh, in the packages and you kind of go, okay, I, I can see why they're doing this absolutely all in on VCF. It's the top of the pyramid. Uh, but again, I think they're also betting on some separate SKUs uh, around their VLR, which is the VMware Live Recovery SKUs that they'll have that are outside of VCF. They'll have some other ones around the private AI space uh, and what they're doing with NVIDIA. Uh, I think that, again, you'll start to see that they're going to say, okay, if you want to go to these higher-end services, VCF is your starting point. Uh, don't even try with standard or essential. Right, and uh, just as a little... Fun fact, Rob, as an aside, since Broadcom announced in May of 2022 the acquisition of VMware, its valuation has more than tripled. So that's pretty amazing. You know, thank you, AI, I guess. All right, let's take a look at some of the alternatives to VMware. Um, they're responding, uh, customers are responding in, in droves. These, you know, that we're showing here, I mean, they were kind of, either struggling or irrelevant or nobody ever talked about them. Uh, so thank you, Broadcom, for bringing this to the to the fore. 
But let's start kind of let's try to take them in rank order. Um, I think, you know, the Acropolis hypervisor, it's basically going from VMware, basically making a horizontal move to another hypervisor that's not VMware. It's a pretty simple move. Uh, and I think that's that is we're going to show with some of the data that has momentum. That is a top option right now. Pretty simple. Uh, you know, you're not uh, you're not basically cloud native or AI native or modernizing. It's just kind of a lift and shift to another hypervisor. And then you got to figure out the modernization strategy. Is that a fair assessment of the, the Nutanix Acropolis hypervisor? My yeah, and I, I think it is very fair. I mean, they've spent the last, you know, five, six years really maturing that hypervisor, uh, which was basically a KVM-based hypervisor uh, that they went and made their own. They support it themselves. They have a lot of packages and integrations and really uh, a lot of the push-button management you would expect from a hyper-converged infrastructure. I think what they've also done is that there are tools from, for migration between VMware and Acropolis. And I think that is one of the key things to start that customers and organizations as they're on this journey are going to be looking for is what platform am I going to go to and how easy is it to get over there? And when I'm once I'm over there, what is the integration with my operations experience? Because right now Nutanix uh, makes a really compelling uh, you know, discussion point because of the ease of use for the platform. Now, um, I think the second really viable option that customers have is moving to the cloud. Remember, I mean, if you're running VMware, you're running Windows workloads or Linux workloads, those all are running in the cloud. Um, obviously, Microsoft is an option here, Azure Stack HCI. You guys, the audience might be familiar with what used to be called Hyper-V. I mean, it's still called Hyper-V, but really Azure Stack HCI is, is really the lead virtualization product there. Of course, AWS and Google both have virtualization alternatives. You can you can move to the cloud. You can go. You can begin to modernize into the cloud. So that's definitely an option. Um, and then, of course, OpenShift, which is obviously cloud friendly. Uh, it's container friendly. OpenShift virtualization uh, has evolved. I think Red Hat Vert is basically now a feature. Rob, correct of OpenShift virtualization. So another. You know, very cloud friendly. You can move from different clouds. You can move on prem. So that gives a lot of optionality for customers. And you know, I would argue that it's probably more AI ready uh, and, and and definitely more cloud native than a lot of the other alternatives. What do you say to those two? The cloud and the OpenShift um, of Red Hat move. Yeah, I, I think that those are really compelling moves. I think when you start to look at AWS or VMware on AWS. Uh, which has kind of become a limited service uh, due to uh, the changes in the way that it was being sold and the discussions between uh, v, you know, Broadcom and AWS. I, I think when you start to look at that, it, it was always one of these things, if you're up there in AWS or in Google uh, and there's VMware on Google Cloud, there's also VMware on Azure, you start to look at those different packages, you're able to actually move or migrate pretty easily between say uh, a VMware VM and an EC2 image. So going to go and be cloud native uh, is fairly easy. There's some licensing tricks that have to be done, but people like AWS, Microsoft, and Google are going to be at the forefront of providing tooling to make that possible. They knew that this, you know, this is always a possibility and actually they looked at it as potentially a gateway for people to come on. They want to use some more of the cloud. They want to use AI. They want to bring things to be more native uh, and not have the VMware piece in there. So I think they've been preparing. Uh, in fact, uh, well, you know, AWS actually went and made an acquisition and an acquire in this space a few years back just to do that. And so I, I think, again, uh, and so did, so did Google and so did... Uh, Microsoft it for Azure. So I, I think everybody has kind of been prepared for this a little bit in the clouds. And I think they're a little bit ahead on that stuff. Now, I think one of the most compelling ones, and, and that's kind of more of a new entrant about a year old now, uh, almost a year old, is the OpenShift Vert, which is a sub, you know, submission of what was uh, Red Hat Vert, which was their KVM stack, which 
those functions and features have been put into OpenShift uh, to actually help with the manageability, uh, help with the bare metal aspects of it, and be able to bring a more compelling full stack. Um, but you start to look at it, still, there's a lot of OpenShift that's actually running on VMware. Uh, I think this is a compelling point for people that are running uh, OpenShift to look at the bare metal version of OpenShift now or one of the cloud-based versions. So if you're running in VMware on one of the clouds and OpenShift is right next door, you could actually have that same type of experience uh, using OpenShift Vert, which is based on KubeVert uh, plus a lot of the other underlying KVM stack that uh, Red Hat had, uh, was, I wouldn't say lying around, but was pretty much deciding to consolidate everything into the OpenShift platform. Yeah, thank you for that. And then, of course, uh, we I put VF Rail in here. I probably should put a big question mark or an X on that when we actually publish tomorrow, uh, and we'll show you some data. VX Rail essentially is is Dell's uh, uh, integration of uh, their hardware in vSAN, which you can no longer uh, you know acquire as a bespoke a la carte service. Now, maybe Michael Dell, um, as the largest shareholder of Broadcom and Dell, maybe he can twist some arms, cut a special deal. We'll see. Uh, but right now, that will show you data on that 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 shows that once prominent uh, platform is um, is being deplatformed as we speak. Uh, so to be continued. Uh, we also show in there. Of course, you've mentioned KVM a couple times. Oracle's got a virtualization stack and has for quite some time. Uh, Hewlett Packard, we think, is uh, running U U Ubuntu, uh, and then of course you've got uh, SUSE with Rancher and Harvester, uh, and then there's this company Proxmox, which I never heard of. It looks like it's a 50-person company with not a lot of support, and um, and then down on the lower right, Rob, tell us about the Apache Cloud Stack. Who's picking that up? Yeah, I, I'm seeing a lot of movement from uh, the CSP MSP market into Apache Cloud Stack. You can kind of think of the ones that were, uh, and we kind of chatted about this before. Where's Open, you know, OpenStack in this whole thing? And really, OpenStack has evolved into a number of different pro projects outside of Telco. Uh, it's really OpenStack is really used more in the Telco stack for doing. Uh, network functions, virtualization, and things of that nature, backend. But a lot of the features that were became independent, uh, I guess you could say open, sta open, sh open source stacks were actually brought into many different projects. And CloudStack is one of those. And I've been, uh, you know, talking to folks that uh, are building out these next-gen clouds, and they're looking at the fact that uh, they've always had something next to VMware, um, but right now they're looking at it. How do we do something that's as mature as VMware that has a community of support around it? And there's some commercial versions of Apache Cloud Stack as well uh, that are gaining some traction. So uh, that's that's a place to watch because some very large uh, MSP CSPs are really taking a taking a shine to it. All right, great. Thanks for that, Rob. Great little rundown there. Let's get into some of the spending data because it's really, I, I'm, I, I'm not often, I don't think I've ever seen anything this dramatic. And it's also somewhat misleading, and we'll explain what we mean by that. But but we're going to get into some of the ETR spending data. As you know, ETR is our, our partner. They do quarterly uh, technology spending intention survey. So this first data chart that we're going to show you, the spending profiles in 600 virtualization accounts. So it's, we cut on virtualization. We have 600 customers who say they're virtualization customers. Um, and then we're, we're, we're showing some of the vendors, and we'll get into this, within the infrastructure software and the virtualization sectors. Okay, so let's, let's start with uh, the vertical axis, which is net score. So it's the shared net score within those 600 virtualization accounts. Net score is a measure of spending momentum that we'll talk about in some detail in a moment. The horizontal axis is the overlap within those 600 accounts, meaning the penetration in those 600 accounts. So the higher you are, the more spending velocity there is on your platform, and the further you are to the right, the larger the penetration. And two things jump right up the, the, the bat. First of all, 
anything over 40% or close to 40% indicates a highly elevated spending momentum. So look at Nutanix. They were down under 10%, you know, several quarters ago, and they've shot up. Um, amazing, right? Then you look at VMware, just the exact opposite. And this makes sense because essentially what Broadcom's doing is they're narrowing down the account base. And the ETR methodology is an account-based methodology. It's the percentage of customers that are spending more versus when you net out those that are spending less. So it's not an indication of dollars spent. We know Broadcom is going to extract more dollars out of its accounts, uh, but it's going to do so with less accounts. So when we said it's somewhat non-intuitive before, it's because it, this looks bad for VMware, but it's exactly the strategy that Hawkman is implementing. And it, again, it doesn't have a revenue implication in this case. So you can see Nutanix shooting up to the 40% mark, amazing. Red Hat, of course, IBM um, is, is you know, very well established in the base. You know, Oracle is big. Uh, you can see VxRail, if we had double clicked on VxRail, you would have seen it much, much higher uh, further um, uh, back. And we'll show you some data there. Uh, Simplicity with HPE, that's one of their plays. And of course, uh, SUSE actually has pretty good momentum, Rob. So your thoughts on this data? Yeah, I, I think the, the, the SUSE, SUSE, whatever you want to call them, their, their momentum and those of Canonical and others in that tribe uh, of open source and the cloud native uh, gang there are, are really going to be big winners in this, I think. And I think, obviously, uh, OpenShift, uh, Vert, Red Hat are definitely the far, far and away the leaders, and they've been the first movers to have first-party uh, versions in the cloud and the on-prem. And also, being partnered up with people like Red Hat is uh, partnered up with uh, on OpenShift, Dell for instance. So I think, and we saw that uh, just this past week, Nutanix uh, extended their relationship with Dell. So when you start to see these types of moves, uh, and you kind of mentioned VxRail being kind of a an X'd out type of product, uh, you start to look at where the momentum is going to come from. And I, I think this, it's not too shocking. I think it, what's shocking is how fast the momentum has shifted. Uh, and that again, is the enthusiasm uh, of those organizations. Because like you said, it's, you know, when they're making plans to figure out where do they go, uh, that that momentum, and they start to see others going places, uh, people like to be where others are. Because, uh, you know, the, the, popular, the popular spot to hide and to go into and really retrench uh, tends to be a good one, because then you get, you know, other people in a community that you're going to. And I, I think Nutanix has a pretty strong community and has been in this space for quite some time uh they're very reliable uh they you know they have uh, high you know net promoter scores and things of that nature uh so i think again you start to look at these different ones and i think we'll probably see that suse will continue to move with rancher and harvester and uh, i would even expect oracle because uh, they have their own version of KVM, their own version of containers. I was looking at the container platforms earlier today, and their container platforms are actually uh, actually moving as well. So when you start to look at these clouds, as we were talking about earlier, I would expect to see all of those also uh, have some afterglow. And I, one of the things that I didn't mention earlier that I think is is another piece of, or piece of the uh, whole uh, transition pie is the fact that people like AWS are, are one of the largest licensors of Windows Server in the world uh, from a corporate standpoint because they have so many people running it on AWS and on in EC2 images. So I wouldn't even roll out rule out that migration to native Microsoft platforms and native Linux platforms on any of the clouds as well. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. We purposely didn't include the clouds on that slide because it would have it would have changed the picture and we wanted to isolate from some of the, the clouds get a lot of attention. A lot of the guys in this virtualization space, a lot of these products, nobody's been paying attention for years because VMware had it sewn up. So that's why we wanted to isolate on those. So let's now, let's double click on that vertical axis. Remember we said it's net score or spending momentum. So this next chart is spending the spending profile on VMware, we have 956 VMware customers, and this is actually astounding uh, data. And I've never seen anything like this before. Normally, you'd look at this and go, "Wow, this company is in trouble." 
But that's not the case here with Broadcom and VMware, and we'll explain why. But let me let me explain the chart first, and then we'll riff on it. So this is the net score granularity. And net score is ETO's proprietary methodology that asks those 956 customers in this case, are you adding the platform new? That's the lime green. And surprisingly to me, 4% of the customers at that 956 are actually adding new. Now, that could be a, a division within a, within a company, and it's already approved. So that maybe is not a new logo, but it's a new footprint, at least from the customer's mind, that they're now bringing in VMware so the, for the first time. That forest green is the percentage of customers that are spending 6% of, or more. And you can see that's that's contracting you know, somewhat, um, you know, pretty, pretty noticeably. The gray is flat spend, plus or minus 5%. And you can see that's actually, you know, kind of holding steady, dropping, dropping a little bit, actually. But what's most stark are their two reds. The pink is spending is down 6% or lower or worse, if you will. That's 18%. I think that's 18. And then the red is churn. So those are the ones that said we're leaving the platform or putting it in isolation. And just look at the reds. Look at how the reds are are increasing. You subtract the reds from the greens, and you get that blue line, which is net score, which has gone from a very respectable 30% back in January 2022, uh, prior to the announcement, a couple months prior to the announcement uh, that Broadcom was buy buying VMware, all the way down to essentially 0%. And Rob, I've never seen a, a chart like this except for uh, a basically a dying legacy company, which clearly VMware um, is legacy, but it's not dying. Yeah. No, I, I think when you start to see all of the people, uh, yeah, I mean, HPE is during Discover talking about their uh, their KVM stack that they're putting out. Re, you know, it was this, this year that they actually had some announcements around SimpliVity for the first time in quite some time. I, I think everybody's kind of taking this and saying, hey, listen, uh, and to your point, Hawk is is executing on his plan. Uh, some of the smaller accounts are moving away. This is even true in the MSP market and the CSP market, where they're moving to an aggregator type of model, where larger CSPs, the ones that are in the pinnacle group, can actually sublease or white label lease uh, VMware licenses down to smaller CSPs uh, to help grow their status within that ecosystem. But again, if you're running an MSP and you're two places removed from VMware and Broadcom, uh, how do you ever become that that size of an account? So I, I think there's some definitely some challenges uh, with that and with some of the channel partners uh, who had massive services uh, around this. But now as the number of accounts were, as we saw in that thing, the pervasion starts to shrink. And like you said, maybe the, the numbers keep continue to go up because the prices go up and, you know, on a smaller base, but and nobody's excited about it. There's no momentum. And there's, I, I'm, like you said, the lime green being there at 4%, I, I'm like, that's just people who are like, okay, we're all in, we're going to pay the tax and we're going to, we're going to go for it. Yeah. And, and pervasion, of course, was that yellow line. I want to go through uh, some very similar charts very quickly, and then you know we're gonna we're gonna riff a little bit and then wrap up. Bring up the next chart. It says spending profile on Nutanix with an N of 249. So we got 249 Nutanix accounts. Same idea here. The the granularity. The green is good. The red is bad. The the gray is flat. Subtract the red from the green. You get that blue line. Look at Nutanix was like in a, like in a knife fight, fighting for account control. You know, and then all of a sudden. October 2023, people start to realize, wow, we have to make some decisions and make some moves. And look at the Nutanix net score, the blue line rockets up from basically the, the low single digits or mid single digits all the way up to, you know, to or above that 30, approaching that 40% mark that we talked about earlier. And you can see that yellow line, that pervasion, that, that pervasion in the data set bumping up. I mean, this is amazing. Alex, bring up the next chart, which is the spending profile on VX Rail with 156 VX Rail accounts. And look, look, look what happens. I mean, it's just the blue line just tanks, the red's going up, the green is shrinking because, you know, vSAN is no more as a standalone product. And that's why, as Rob said, the uh, uh, Dell and Nutanix are getting together. 
And that's going to be a very powerful combination. Nutanix has the solution. Dell has the distribution channel. Uh, they've got the customer install base. And that, Rob, is, as you mentioned, is going to be a pretty powerful combination that's going to, we think, win some share. Totally agree. I think that that one to me is 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 really because they were the winners uh, previously when they you know owned VMware and then even after they rolled VMware back out with the uh, licensing agreements that they had. I think it's leveled the playing field significantly uh, in that space uh, for the actual compute and storage layer, uh, the infrastructure and the network underneath the software. Uh, that people like Nutanix and others and the KVM stacks and the open shifts of the world provide. Uh, I, I think it's going to be a really interesting uh, year, to put it mildly, because, you know, again, it's not like uh, these uh, some of these accounts aren't massive. So those with the better channels, those with the better, uh, better enabled channels, better MSP play or CSP plays, cloud service providers or managed service provider plays, and I think SIs are going to play another role big role in that as well. Okay, Alex, bring up the, the, the next chart, spending patterns. This is going to be redundant, but I'll just make the, put a, a punctuation on all this conversation. Spending patterns in 945 VMware accounts. So there's 945 VMware accounts that we we filtered on, and then we, we just chose a, a few of these names, Nutanix, VxRail. You can say VxRail, as VxRail goes down, Nutanix goes up, making that partnership very interesting. SUSE or SUSA. Uh, um, they changed the name. Uh, Melissa Di Donato changed the name to Sousa. Maybe they're back to Sousa. At any rate, you can see where they are. Hewlett Packard Enterprise uh, with its uh, offerings and Red Hat, um, you know, very, very strong as well, strong momentum. So that's going to gonna play pretty well uh, in the marketplace. And then, um, Alex, bring up the last slide. I'll go through it, Rob, and then we can kind of, you know, wrap up here. Um, this, this slide, uncertainty catalyzes strategy shifts. Large customers, you got to evaluate the expiration of your ELA timeframe. As we say, work backwards from there. Isolate those core workloads. You got to have to bite the bullet on the Broadcom tax. You know, the, 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 the large migrations, if you can take advantage of the full VCF stack, in many cases, you're going to be better off, you know, paying what's been reported 25 to to even 500%, we've even heard one customer said 1,200%, you know, uh, increase in prices. I mean, it's, it's painful, but migrations are super risky and you can risk your company on those. Your second point here, net new workloads are gonna go to either go to another hypervisor like Acropolis, they're gonna go to the cloud, or they're gonna go to some modern AI enabled containerized stack, either open source or, or open shift. Um, and of course, Microsoft is a huge player here. And then you got all these other uh, uh, offerings out there as well. There's a spate of them, probably not are, are all going to succeed. You know, the cloud guys are going to do well. Uh, Acropolis is going to get a boost. You know, this is just another tailwind for, for Red Hat, OpenShift. They've had a lot of them in the past couple of years. You know, if you're on ESX free and you're not paying VMware, or ESXi, you migrate off. You know, you're not going to, there's no, if they're not mission critical apps, you can move you know, off to another platform. You can go to uh, Acropolis if you don't want to go to the cloud. You can go to an MSP. They'll help you manage it. You know, keep it simple in those cases. But the large MSPs, so flipping to the MSP view, if you made the cut, you know, you're going to dig in with customers. You're going to help them through this, this time. But you also, in our opinion, you better hedge your bets because you don't know what's coming down the road. So, you know, now is the time, if you haven't already diversified, and you likely have, if you're a large MSP, uh, but you want to start to solidify those alternative, you know, paths and vectors to, to revenue. You know, the smaller VMware specialized MSPs and partners, you need to make the cut. You better diversify, especially if you're relying on a lot of VMware revenue or you're going to die. And then the last thing I'd say, oh, you, you go to Reddit and you search VMware Broadcom, you will see some of the frustration from customers in terms of the support gaps, especially for those smaller customers who aren't going to spend a ton of dough with Broadcom VMware. Um, there's services opportunities there for partners, Rob, um, because uh, there's a lot of frustration and, and a lot of difficulty sorting out licenses, getting support. So MSPs and, and service partners, to your point, SIs, 
uh, can be super helpful there. Yeah, I, I think that is definitely a key. And I think what we'll see is that the MSPs and the CSPs are really going to move quickly uh, to other stacks. Uh, they already, in most cases, had another stack side by side. Uh, usually it was something to run their Kubernetes on. Uh, I think that you'll get, start to see that accelerate. I also think that, you know, the, the smaller accounts will definitely be looking uh, to how they can leverage it. And like I said, a, a good in way that you said actually is moving those smaller workloads that you can't transition in those smaller accounts up to an MSP. So you can get the licensing at that MSP's cost, not at you, the cost that would impact you. Um, I do think that some of the larger VCF accounts will be enabled by the things like AI, that private AI, that AI, um, that Broadcom VMware is bringing to bear. And I think they, they're they doing some interesting stuff on the Tanzu side still too uh, that for that VCF platform. So I think the ones that do remain will get extended value out of that. But I think, again, it's it's at what cost? And can you, can you does the ROI really uh, help with that? And I think, like you said, the ecosystem around it for partners and for other ISVs is going to be very interesting to see how that plays out as well. Yeah, and a couple of things I'm, I'm watching, you know, Project Monterey ostensibly is no more. That was essentially VMware's and the ecosystem's play on uh, AWS Nitro, enabling things like Graviton and alternative uh, um, CPU, GPU, NPU, et cetera. So we'll see. Will some of the, the larger uh, hardware companies like an HPE or a Dell, who certainly have the capabilities if they wanted to, HPE, Cisco, have, have, have custom silicon shops, Dell maybe not so much, but certainly has the resources, will they begin to develop some of their own silicon? Maybe in partnership with Broadcom, that would be kind of interesting. And I think the other thing is, you know, Broadcom talks about how it invests and invests in R&D. I want to see investments in the AI stack to support uh, these private AI. They've got to, they've got to keep pace. And uh, in my view, you know, they're not. Well, they're behind. They're not viewed as an AI leader, and so they've got to, they've got to play catch up there. But I think there's a lot of partnerships that they can affect. And certainly, Broadcom knows a lot about AI from the from the silicon stack. All right, Rob, hey, thanks a lot. Fantastic insights as always. Really appreciate your time. Thanks for having me in. Oh, you bet. Okay, that's it for now. Thanks to Alex Myers and Shipman on production. And they also do our podcast, Kristen Martin and Cheryl Knight help get the word out on social media and uh, in our newsletters. And Rob Hope is our editor-in-chief over siliconangle.com. Remember, all these episodes are available as podcasts wherever you listen. Just search Breaking Analysis Podcasts. I publish each week on the QResearch.com and SiliconAngle.com. You can email me at david.vellante at SiliconAngle.com or DM me at dvellante at Real Stretch or Rob Stretch A or comment on our LinkedIn posts. And please check out etr.ai for the best survey data in the enterprise tech business. This is Dave Vellante for Rob Hope and the Q Research Insights powered by ETR. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time on Breaking Analysis.